Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome. I'm so glad that uh, so many of you showed up to uh, help us study and think about and learn about Eurasian milfoil and its effect on the pond. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a, a little upsetting and a little surprising, and we all want to do something about it. And we're here to learn about, you know, how it got here, what it does, what it's all about, um, and what are our options. So first, if some of you don't know who's on the Martin's Pond Reclamation Study Committee, I just wanted to um, kind of just point you out to these people so you can stop them and stop and shop and ask about Martin's Pond or anything else. Uh, we have Kath Jeffrey on Scannell, Chris Butler, George Cangiano, uh, Lori Lines, and where's Larry? Oh, and in the back is um, Larry Susie. So um, did I miss anybody? No. Oh, and I'm Janet Nicosia. So tonight we have uh, four presentations, four short presentations that will kind of get you up to speed on where we're at, how we got here, and then we'll have a question and answer session, um, and everybody will have, be able to uh, ask whatever they would like. We, we'd ask that everyone would be respectful of different opinions that might be in the house. Um, and with that, I am going to, oh, we also wanted to mention this. there's a survey at the end of tonight. Um, we'd like you to fill that out, and we have a box in the back to leave it in. Um, so that we kind of feel like, you know, after learning what you've learned tonight, how do you feel about it? What methods do you think appeal to you? You know, what do you, would you have questions or additional comments? Would you like additional information? We also have a sign-up sheet over here if um, anybody wants to be on a list to help us um, combat this or um, other invasive species. There's some refreshments, water, and um, goodies in the back. Um, and I think that's it. So I will introduce... Uh, we have for our, our four presentations, um, our first one is going to be Dr. John Lyon, who's the uh, chair of the Department of Biology at Merrimack College, been studying the pond for uh, over a decade. And um, take it away, John. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. I'll be quick. Uh, I'm John Lyon. This is my, that's me. That's the picture. So I'm going to talk about a survey that I did last year, but also some information that goes back 12 years. I'm going to give you a little pointer thing there. So first question is why I do this? You know, I've been involved in monitoring aquatic plants on Martin's Pond since 2002, right? As, uh, with a, as a college professor with students and stuff like that. Why do we do it? So one is that, there's my little, see that little sign there? <laughs> so we have a record of plant changes that goes back to 2002, which is nice. So Martin Pond, Martin's Pond is kind of fortunate that it has a long-term database to look back on so you can see where, it, where you're coming from and, and where it might go. So that's useful. The other one is it's early detection. When you're out, if you do it regularly, you know what's coming. You can identify it and, and pick things, as I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, next is that you can react quickly and appropriately when you find it and where it is. It's not just that it's there, it's where it is, too. We do, we locate individual kind of clumps of plants that they like that. And then ultimately, uh, establish trigger points, what it gives a threshold, any particular species, in this case we're talking about milfoil, but other critters like fanwort and other species, when does it get above a certain threshold and a trigger in action, and ultimately, um, my little thing, evaluate your management actions. I'm not, I don't live on the pond, I'm not a resident of North Reading, it's a fine town. I live in southern New Hampshire um, and, and work at Merrimack College, so I like to think of myself as a uh, um, 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 helping you guys achieve what you're trying to do and to monitor what's happening before and after and during and help that way. Um, but not, it's not my pond. Uh, it's not my property. So I'm cautious about um, uh, kind of making recommendations about that. I think that comes from the, from the community, what's there, but I'm happy to support the community that way. So anyway, why we do it? So here's a graph. It's a little complicated, but it's not that complicated. So we've been doing studies since 2002, and I just picked out four species. So fanwort. Here it is in 2002, here's 2003, and so we didn't do surveys every year, but 2002 up to 2014. And this is just a change in frequency to give you an idea what's going on in the pond. So fanwort, first did the first survey, this is the frequency on, so we did a bunch of plots, a bunch of points. I'll show you how we do this. But it was about 58% of the pond, 58% of the plots on the pond, of the points in the pond had fanwort. 2004, that went up to 68%, 67%. Then there was some management that was done on the pond. It was mowed, basically. You can see in 2006, 2007, um, it was dropped off quite rapidly, uh, quite precipitously. 
and then the fan board kind of slowly has come back in various iterations. In 2014, there's actually still very little fan board. So here's an example of management action traced over time, right? Um, and this is why these surveys can help. Here's coontail, which is not an invasive species, but just to show you, there's also not just the target species. We measure all the critters in the pond. So coontail, which is a, a native critter, it also fluctuates and also responded to the harvesting that was done um, in the middle of the last decade, and it's kind of come back in different ways. Uh, water chestnut, we kind of first picked it out of the sample in 2009, uh, not 2010, again in 2011. Uh, due to hand pulling efforts, this is this kind of early detection, right? By doing the regular surveys, the early detection that was found and it's been hand pulled, and in 2014 we didn't find any on the pond. And then Eurasian, spelled wrong, sorry about that. You Asian. Your Asian will build for you. You can see in 2014 it's on 70% of the plots. It's not that dense, but it's everywhere. So here's another kind of early detection. And here it is and goes. So in going forward with this, you can see going forward, you want to track not only the critters that you're concerned about, but all the different critters on the pond. We can do that. We can make, uh, we have a record of all the plants that we found over those years. So it, like I said, it's a good thing because you can really look at any kind of management that you do. You can see the impacts on the whole pond and you have a historical record to kind of put it in context. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give my light turbidity color spiel. Um, this is kind of a scientific slide, but it's a good one. Light turbidity color. Martin's pond is brownish, and it's got a lot of turbidity. And that is its saving grace in many ways from when you have invasions like this, okay? Uh, importance of the interactions between light, temperature, nutrients. We've been discussed a lot of time. A lot of these studies came out of Wisconsin. That's where I came out of. So there's been a lot of study looking at this. They're complex systems, right? These turbid ponds where they're brown and there's algae. Next one, please. <laughs> and you know, going forward, any management plan, you have to take this kind of complexity. Here's just a photograph of right, Martin's Pond. You've seen it. Um, next slide. This is complicated, but it's, it is what it is. So macrophytes are these plants in the middle that grow in this pond, and they're affected by uh, growth, their growth. They need sunlight, right? They have plenty of nutrients. They have plenty of sediment. sediment. They're limited by uh, light in many cases. And, that light is reduced because of turbidity. There's stuff floating in the water. It can be algae, it can be suspended sediments. Um, it has to do with the water depth is influenced by this. The color of the water, right? It's this natural tea colored water that's coming in from the Scug River, right? From the tannic acids and the oak leaves around here. It's a naturally colored water system, right? And so in any given year, depending on the level of this, this really rapidly can slow down plant growth in the spring and in the summer. Uh, and so even without any management, plants fluctuate in the pond. If Martin's pond were clear, right, if it were clearer and it had all these nutrients on the bottom, the plant, the pond would be completely covered with aquatic plants. And most ponds, a lot of ponds in the area that are six feet deep on average are completely covered. What helps maintain the open area is the fact that it's so turbid. So this is a good thing, right? Um, it, it's, it's your friend in many ways. Um, if you have very clear lakes, um, plants, invasive plants can come in and grow very rapidly. So, um, but you have to keep this into consideration and any kind of thing. It, it, it's really an important part of what Martin's Pond is. Okay, excellent. So your Asian water milk foil, you're gonna hear a lot about it. You probably know enough about it. Next one, uh, so there's the species, submerged aquatic plants, native to Europe and Asia. The next one, um, particularly problematic. Uh, reduces from, can reproduce from fragments, pieces break off and they can and reroute and spread rapidly. Um, high growth, grows quickly on the surface, it can shade other stuff. That's been known for a while in a lot of different places. There's a lot known about it. Um, so let's get to the 2014 survey, what we did. Kind of the state of Eurasian milfoil in a pond. So, uh, next one. Sorry. Thank you, Lori. So it was done, and we did this one from July 19th to 24th by me and a couple of students. Next one. Um, each dot represents a sample point. So we don't do the whole, we do the best we can. We, each point is uh, connected to a GPS unit, and we measure both the, uh, so we get the overall frequency, and we also measure the density of each plant that we find in each one of these plots. So we did a total of 244 sample points, and 170 of these different points had different um, aquatic plants. So we go around the island, and it's not complete, but it gives you a pretty good coverage of what's going on. Next one. And we use this rate method developed in Wisconsin where I cut my teeth on this stuff. It's, it's not perfect, but it's a pretty quick and rapid and pretty accurate method. You throw this rake out over the side, it's just a thatch rake. It drags along the bottom, and you can see whatever it pulls up, you can analyze. So whatever's rooted and floating in there, you can pick up. So it's a pretty good, uh, reasonably good, relatively rapid system that you can pick up 
most critters on it. Uh, okay, so here's the cut to the chase. This is a funky looking slide, but I think it says what I need wanted to say. So this is an area of, this black area, first of all, represents an area where there's only sporadic individual milfoil plants. I don't know why I did it in black, but I did. Uh, low density represents green, and then it gets higher density, it goes into this, uh, what color is that, mauve? We'll call that a hot mauve. <laughs> I don't know why I chose that palette. But you can see the density is variable on the pond. Okay? So up in the northwest corner, you see there's a little higher density of it here, um, and patches on the eastern shore, a little bit in the south. Um, and so, like I said before, the frequency was found on 70% of the plots, so the milfoil is widespread in the pond. But its density is relatively low at this point, which makes sense early on in the invasion. In this black area, doesn't mean that there's no plants. What there are were sporadic plants throughout here. Okay? And that's new to the pond to see um, 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 Eurasian milfoil kind of growing up from up to six feet deep. So it's here. Um, it's primarily near the shoreline. I've got a summary slide at the end. I'll show you what it is. Um, it's a relatively low density in many cases, but it's a high frequency. Next slide. And this is just showing the frequency of the plots, right? 70%. Out of those 244 plots that we measured, 70 of them, 70% 70 of those had milfoil on them. So it's pretty widespread, you know, low density. So to cut to the chase, my end here of my presentation, milfoil was densest near the shore, including the island and bands that kind of ran parallel to the shoreline, but not right up to the shoreline. In many cases, 20, 30 feet out, and the bands were typically 20, 25 feet wide, at least in July. Um, thus, the highest densities were near the shore, but not immediately adjacent to the shore. That's kind of the state of the next one. Um, Milfoil had relatively low density immediately along the shoreline in most cases around the entire pond. If you're in the first uh, few feet of water or the first 20 feet out, there weren't a lot. There wasn't a lot of milfoil. It was. It was had its own kind of um, depth that it found. Yeah. Uh, I was at low densities with the lily pad beds. Interesting. So you get the three species of lily pad. There's the white, the yellow, and then the the other one, the uh, shield. Um, but because it's so well, apparently, I guess because of the light, but underneath the lily pad beds, there wasn't much move. But immediately denser, when you had gaps between the lily pad beds, you'd find it, right? And then also near the shoreline on the outer fringes of many lily pad beds on the edge of it, that you'd find on the floor. So in looking at this, I say this because you know it's going to change over time and the densities can change, but in this initial outbreak, um, that's been found here, it's variable, right? There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of variability of where it's found right now. And it's not all just completely covered in the pond, right? There's certain areas where it's higher density and others where it's not. Uh, next one. Um, sporadic plants are observed in many low density areas and water depths ranging up to six feet. So this is where you see sporadic plants, so plants throughout the pond um, that were right, rooted on the bottom and came up at least to six feet depth, which is unusual based on the brown color of the water, right? Um, that usually the middle part of the pond, you don't see a lot of things growing, but there were sporadic plants throughout, which is indicating that they're, they're getting and they're getting established in areas where other plants have not. And also interesting is there is a relatively low co-occurrence of milfoil with fanwort and coontail, two other common plant species. Uh, near the shorelines, you'd find a band of fanwort and coontail kind of growing together. There was no milfoil in there, right? Uh, the milfoil was um, outside those bands. So uh, again, the milfoil was, was uh, segregated out, um, wasn't found in the lily pads, and it wasn't found growing with fanwort and coontail. Um, so anyway, next, last one. And then finally, anyone that's been on the pond in the summer, you recognize when you start looking around that fragments are everywhere, right? Milfoil fragments are everywhere. Um, uh, we're found throughout the pond. The species has great potential to spread through fragmentation and vegetative propagation. There's really very little to do about that. Um, but um, so, curious about what happens next year, but um, overall, this is kind of the state of where it's at. It's clearly there, relatively low density in most places, but a high frequency. Okay. And again, we have years of data before it, so we kind of know what's in the pond before this has come out, and we can track going forward, um, continue to see how uh, both what it does, even without management, or with management, or both, can kind of see how it affects all the other plant species so like I said, I think you guys are fortunate and you have a nice, rich data set and a history 
uh, to put um, the, the, the milfoil in context about what its impacts are in the long term and short term. And so this monitoring um, has been very helpful, I think, and can continue to be helpful. So anyway, here's my spiel on the state of milfoil in Martin's Pond. Okay. Um, Hope that was helpful. As I said before, we're going to get through the presentations, and then so I ask you to hold your questions. To tell. George is going to give us a short presentation on his experience with hand pulling. So I live on the pond, and if anybody else is here, I, I assume we have people that live on the shoreline who've seen this stuff and have seen this stuff spread. Uh, it was here the year before last, but this year, if, again, if you live on the pond, it's pretty much doubled and tripled. So as a homeowner, I became very concerned and I did my research and I found that, you know, this stuff really is invasive and there's treatment options. And one of the low cost option is hand pulling. So I wanted to kind of do a little sample, which I'll, I'll, I'll go into in a minute uh, of the square footage and how much I pulled, but I just wanted to see. Sure. On, yeah. Just so we can get you on. Yeah. Where should I be? In the microphone. He can stand over. How can he stand over? <laughs> <laughs> He's Dr. Lyon. Oh, well. <laughs> Gee, I wanted to kind of float around. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do was do some testing on my own to see how effective hand pulling is and how much work it actually was. So before I could do that, I did a lot of research on the right way to hand pull milfoil, and it is a very tedious process. So, so let me talk about the hand pulling technique. How many people out here have pulled milfoil out of the pond? Just a couple people, okay. So those of you who live on the pond, who um, want to do some hand pulling next year, this would be good for you because you're gonna get a lesson on how to do it the right way. Because if you do it the wrong way, uh, you, you, you could actually uh, have an adverse effect and spread it even further. So, first bullet please. So you need to remove the entire plant from the bottom, including the root crown. If you leave the root, if you leave pieces, any fragments left behind, as we just learned, even a one inch piece can start a whole new colony. So you need to get the whole root from the bottom, okay? You need to place the entire plant in a secure device when you pull it up. I had a small boat tethered to me, so when I pulled up the plant, the root in the mud, I put it right in the boat. Because if you don't do that, again, there's seeds in the water and there's seeds in the mud. And if just one of those roots break off, again, you can start a whole new colony. You need to watch for all fragments that way may break away. What I noticed is after <coughs> about a half an hour of hand pulling, when I was ready to clear out the boat, when I came back to the pond and I looked around, there were little tiny fragments that I had to go out there with a strainer to pull out. And again, those little tiny fragments can float away and can start a whole new colony. So you need to be very, very careful and make sure that you get all the pieces. The one thing that I saw this year, and, and trust me, I can relate because being a homeowner, it is very unsightly. You know, for those of us who enjoyed the pond, who've enjoyed kayaking, now it has a different look around the shoreline. And especially when you look out and you see all that brown stuff floating on the top, you just say, I gotta get this out of here. And I've seen it. I've seen a few people that just kind of went crazy this year, just pulling all the stuff haphazardly, throwing it in a bag, and that's the worst thing you can do because haphazard hand pulling is you're only getting what's on the top. You're leaving behind what's on the bottom, and again, it's gonna start growing again, and all of the pieces that have come off with that haphazard pulling are gonna make things worse. And this stuff comes back very quickly, and I'll talk about that in a second because there's so much care needed. A lot of the research that I conducted that they caution people not to hand pull on their own, in fact, to bring in professionals. Um, I have uh, a contact on one of the boards up at no Northwood Lake, uh, who they have a milfoil issue, but they bring in professional divers who will actually dig out, bag the plant, and then they'll actually suck the plant out, and then it'll go through a processing and release the water back in. It's a very expensive, it's very costly. What I also found is hand pulling really works best when it's a smaller body of water. So the effectiveness of hand pulling. So I judged about a 2,000 square foot area in between one and five shore road. That is my frontage and that carries three houses over almost up to Chris's house there. And for reference, Martin's Pond is 92 acres and there's 43,000 square feet in an acre. You don't, you'll probably need a calculator, do the math, but I just did a small little area and you can see how, how, how big it really is. 
So the process, I did three pulling sessions, two hours per session. And after two hours, you are tired. Your arms are tired, your feet are tired, because it is what it is. You're out there working and you're out there pulling. I took approximately 300 pounds of milfoil. And I carefully removed, uh, and the, the, uh, that were carefully removed. And the weight included the plants, the root crowns, the mud, the seed water. So all of that weight just wasn't the plant itself, but it was very, very dense. And I'm going to show you some pictures in, in a minute from my actual pulling session so you can see. So from the surface, the front of my house looked great. I didn't see anything. I could look out. I had nice, clear water. Within two weeks, as I went out on my dock, I could see the milfoil was already back. It was back about two feet. And then after four weeks, it looked like I never touched it. And it was very disheartening for me because it seemed like an effort and futility. So, but I did want to try it out just to see how effective it was. And you know, if, if, if you're a property owner and you want to do this the right way, you're just going to have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And it might be worth it just to keep your property clear. But if you are not going to do it the right way, you're better off not to touch it because you could make things worse. And studies show that hand pulling by professionals is effective in lakes and ponds, as I just said, where it's very small or the infestation is at a very low rate. So that's thick matting just from one plant. And that particular plant that I pulled was actually in front of Three Shore Road. There was a small painted turtle that was caught up in all of the... Am I all right to walk over? <laughs> I was caught up, and, and this is very thick and very stringy, and I had to free the turtle, and that was in front of my house. So that's just for, for folks who are concerned about wildlife, it's something to consider, because this matting is very, very thick, and the turtle was about that big, and it just couldn't break free. Turtle was fine, swam away. <laughs> so that's the root crown. That's the base of the plant that I pulled, and you can see all of this white spaghetti, that's the root. And if you don't pull that up and you leave it in there, it's just going to regrow again. And that was about after 30 minutes of pulling. It's about 25 pound load, including the mud, the water, and the milfoil itself. And bear in mind, the milfoil was very damp because it just came from the pond. So, um, so anyway, that's what I just wanted to share with you. Um, and, you know, that's the result. So thank you. George. Okay, now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Balloud, who was the um, aquatic um, biologist from Aquatic Control Technologies. They're um, probably the, the um, most commonly used lake management company in um, uh, Massachusetts and maybe in New England. But thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. I, uh Thanks for inviting me and uh, happy to come and just talk a little bit. I really, I wanted to focus most of my discussions because of the communications I had with Janet after she indicated it had been discovered out here, the Eurasian water milfoil, um, we really focused the discussion on herbicide treatment. And we, we are a multi-service company, so we do all the different strategies, uh, including running a fleet of harvesters and floating hydro rakes to go out and mechanically remove vegetation, but this plant probably more so than any of the other submersed plants. We really don't recommend um, harvesting or raking because as Dr. Lyon explained, it does reproduce by fragmentation. It's almost impossible to contain the fragments. And if you start to harvest this plant, you seem to just accelerate its growth and spread. So um, if harvesting hasn't been done already and the infestation is low like it is now in terms of um, a low density, you know, we wouldn't recommend that as a strategy. So we were really looking at um, herbicide options. And the nice thing about Eurasian water milfoil in particular, this, this Myriophyllum spicatum, is that it's very susceptible to a bunch of different herbicides. Um, so we, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox as far as being able to manage this plant. Unlike fanwort, which um, when that was discovered in here years ago, there really wasn't a good product available that would manage the fan wart, and that's why the, the pulling and harvesting was looked at to control that plant. But here you have um, you know, probably the most cost-effective and, and selective way to manage this would be by using the herbicides. So I guess one thing I just wanted to make clear in talking about herbicides so everybody understood is that 
it's a little different than when you're using an herbicide on land or in a terrestrial setting because there you're generally applying the herbicide to the plant specifically. You're trying to spray the leaves, you know, you're putting the, the pellets uh, you're on the grass. Um, so you're actually putting the herbicide directly on the plant. When we do treatments in lakes, what we're really trying to do is establish a concentration of herbicide in the water and then the plants absorb the herbicide out of the water. And it doesn't matter if we're using a liquid, which are generally injected subsurface, um, you know, from uh, hoses that trail the boat, or if we use granular or pelletized products, those will sink to the bottom. But in any case, we're trying to establish a concentration of herbicide in the water, and then the plant will absorb the herbicide out of the water. So in an effect, we're treating the water. Um, and then this is the other really most important thing about you know all herbicide treatments in aquatics is that regardless of what the product is there's a relationship between how high the concentration is and how long the plant is exposed to it and it's that concentration exposure time curve that tells you how effective it will be a treatment will be and this this curve is for a product um, called triclopyr but basically what it says is if if you kind of if you have a high exposure but you don't have very long contact time, your treatment won't be very effective. But conversely, you can have a lower exposure or a lower concentration but a longer exposure time and you might get an effective treatment. So it's, it's how long that product is available in the water for the plants to absorb it and then what the, what the target concentration is for that particular species. So, you know, knowing you know, what we knew about milfoil and what we know about uh, Martin's Pond, we kind of ran through um, for the association just um, what some of the major options are in terms of herbicides here based on the current rules of restrictions in Massachusetts and you know, really what you're up against with Martin's Pond. And, and right now I think there's probably three products that could be considered for use out here you know, fairly effectively on the milfoil. One is called Floridone, one's called Diquat, and another one's called Triclopyr. And um, Sandra will share some of her experiences with, with you know, really all of those um, in Natick. But, you know, they're different products. They're all effective on milfoil. They have different <coughs> modes of action um, in, in the way that they affect the plants, and they're, they're different types. Um, Floridone and Triclopyr are considered systemic. So that means that it kills the entire plant, including the root, whereas diquat, the one in the middle, is a contact. So that's, that's a more rapid kill of the plant, but it's only targeting the vegetation that's above the sediment. It's not getting as much of the root control. <coughs> so there's, um, you know, there's, they have differences in environmental fate, how long they stay in the environment. There's different water use restrictions. Really, with all of these products in Massachusetts, there are no, you know, with all three of these, there's no restriction on swimming on the EPA label. Now, it's usually prudent practice. Whenever we do a treatment, we like to recommend closure of a lake on the day of treatment just to keep people out of the water and to reduce exposure. But the longest restrictions are usually using water from the lake that's been treated for irrigation purposes. So if people are watering their lawns, watering gardens, you got to hold off on that for days, sometimes weeks, because those, those herbicide concentrations that are in the water could have impact on what you're trying to irrigate. Um, so there's benefits and <coughs> probably some, some detriments or limitations you know, for all of these products at Martin's Pond, and you, you probably have to weigh all of those against each other. Um, as Dr. Lyon said, the the pond is so influenced by color and turbidity, uh, you know, my initial feeling is you could probably do treatment with the diquat, the one in the middle, which is the least expensive product, it's the fastest acting. Um, it would probably give you good initial control of the milfoil while this is still an early infestation and you know you see how effective it is because it may last longer than it typically does. A lot of times we treat ponds with diquat ponds and lakes and we'll get one year worth of control, one season of control and the plants will come back. But there's other situations where it will last longer 
and Martin's Pond may be one where it would last longer because it hasn't been in here that long to begin with. The roots aren't as established as they are in some other lakes. And with that turbidity, you may just not get enough sun to go back and allow this to recover. As far as the other two, the, the two systemic products, um, you know, fluoridone would be nice, the first one, because it kills milfoil and it would kill the fanwort, you know, which is another invasive plant you have out here. The challenge with that is it has to be in the water for such a long period of time, and Martin's Pond gets a lot of inflow and it flushes pretty, pretty quickly. So you'd have to do multiple applications to maintain a low dose in the water. I think it can be done here. It would be a challenging treatment. It would be much more expensive than, than just doing spot treatment with diquat, but um, that would be a way to target both invasive species. And then, you know, finally the triclopyr, um, another systemic product, so you're going to get longer term control. And usually with the systemics, when you kill the roots, um, you may see two, three, sometimes four years of of reduced growth, reduced vigor of the plant before you need to manage it again. But I do want to stress that in any instance, I mean, it's very unusual to eradicate a plant with an herbicide. So there is going to be a need for ongoing management and whichever product you use or, or probably whichever approaches you use, because in most cases you're doing an integrated type of a management program where you may treat one year and then resort to hand pulling or, or a diver-assisted hand pulling or something in a non-treatment year. So, but you will likely need to, to stay on top of it and continue to monitor it. And just a couple quick examples. This was a this was a, you know not too far away at Lake Atitash, and they they had Eurasian water milfoil discovered. I believe it was in um, it was either 2009 or 2010. They were having some work done by the EPA. And it spread pretty remarkably. So by 2011, it had gone around the entire shoreline out there. And that's a 360-acre lake. It was like it is in Martin's Pond. It was varying density, but it was over a pretty big footprint. Um, they decided that they were going to proceed with a treatment program. They did a, a sonar, a fluoridone treatment, where we, we essentially treated the whole shoreline where all the milfoil was growing. And that was in 2012. And then um, that worked really well. So 2012, the milfoil was controlled. 13, there was a little bit that started to come back, and they had divers go in and start to hand pull it. This past year, they had a little bit more starting to come back. We did do a small spot treatment in this cove. So it was a, just a couple of acres where it was too heavy to hand pull. Um, and that was with the triclopyr herbicide, the other systemic. And you know they're continuing to monitor and evaluate whether they'll need to do more spot treatment um, this coming year and beyond. But you know basically reduced milfoil from over 150 foot, 150 acre footprint down to you know just a handful of acres a couple of years later. Um, this was this is another project with with renovator triclopyr. This is Lake Maury in Vermont on the Vermont New Hampshire border. And this was a project where they had basically the, the entire shoreline was infested with milfoil and developed a plan to treat it with, with renovate with triclopyr because it has high selectivity for native plants. And they have about 20 different native plants out here that the state was very worried about protecting. So um, we treated various areas, and these were in consecutive years, 2008 or 7, 8, and 9. And part of this was doing part of the lake at a time, and, and some others were dealing with permit conditions and, and treatment timing, but um, we did start to get ahead of it. The milfoil population was reducing, and you can see if you look at these were the, the, the vegetation surveys, one of the vegetation surveys that were done, you can just see the general location of milfoil. So by the end of the 2009 treatment, um, it was down to just hand pull levels. And then they hand pulled for a couple of years, they did a spot treatment in 2012, and they've hand pulled for, for a year, for two years, and now they're looking at another spot treatment coming up in 2015. And then um, the last one that I wanted to talk about was the, the, the last product, the reward herbicide. This is the contact that just kills the plant and doesn't really kill the root. <coughs> 
But this is a, um, a lake in northwest Connecticut, Salisbury, called the Twin Lakes. And they have some rare species. So we were actually only allowed to treat in these blue areas with the diquat because in these, these yellowish areas, they had a couple different rare plants that the state was worried about protecting. So we started using diquat in there, recognizing it would only be an annual type spot treatment just to, just to control the milfoil, keep it at bay. And I think when we started, we were doing about 65 or 70 acres in this, this basin of, of East Twin. Um, there have been annual treatments, but the, the amount of acreage has reduced quite a bit. And I think last year we did under 30 acres, sort of this orange hatched area. And you can see some of the shorelines just don't really support the milfoil anymore. So after consecutive years of treatment with the diquat, it's really reduced it down and we're only seeing it come back in a few areas. Um, so that's been an effective uh, treatment program with diquat. And I guess really the reason that we do it, this is just another picture of the roots, but um, this was a, a milfoil plant that we actually found in southern New Hampshire, but this is one foot graduations on this rod, so there was over a foot of root material, you know, and really that was one clump of plants that was floating in the water. So it can get pretty dense and pretty robust, and you want to try to manage it before you're dealing with that kind of a, a type of milfoil. So that was pretty much what I had. So thank you. Okay. Our last um, uh, presenter is Sandra Brennan, chairman of the Constituent State Park Advisory Committee, on her experience with um, controlling it in their lake. Thank you. I'm going to put a timer on so I'll stick to my 10 minutes, if I can. It's going to be less than that, actually. Start. Perfect. And I I'm Sandra Brennan, and I'm the chairman of the Kachichua State Park Advisory Committee. I've served on that committee since 1989 in different capacities, including chairman. Um, I also have a master's degree in chemistry from Boston College and um, not here on behalf of the Kachichua State Park Advisory Committee. I'm here just to give a personal account. Um, I have family who lives on this lake, my sister Janet. Like many of you, I grew up on or near a lake and a pond, Dudley Pond and Lake Kachichua specifically. I got involved in everything from cleanups to dealing with our dam and the water levels and joined a group to help the lake, like many of you. And like you too, I stressed over witnessing a milfoil infestation take over my home lake. We now have a successful management program at Kachichua State Park. It took 13 years. I've enjoyed Martin's Pond with my sister, her family, her friends. I brought my kids here for the Halloween and winter festivals. I've been on the pond in a kayak and a dog sled. It's a beautiful pond with a great history of people coming together to do so much, like fixing the bathhouse, installing playground equipment, the turtle trail, the sand volleyball court to keep teenagers busy, the dock, the fencing, the signage. It's a beautiful place. Like you, I know Martin's Pond is worth saving for future generations. And I know from my experience that it can be saved. Next slide. We're there. Lake Achichuit is a six. Where's the red dot? <laughs> I feel like I'm on Seinfeld. <coughs> oh, wait, you have to press this button. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, you have to hold it. Okay, I got it. Um, it's a 600 acre lake with a maximum depth of over 60 feet. It's three ponds at 200 acres each. Martin's pond would probably fit right into here. 
So it's pretty big. It flows though, like Martin's Pond, and there's a dam right here. So it flows south to north. Um, if you've gone out the Mass Turnpike and gone by exit 13, you cross over it. So now the next time, if you haven't, the next time you're on the Mass Pike, you'll see it. It does flow from south to north. I live up here. Our nightmare began in, began in 2002 in South Pond at the U.S. Army Natick Labs boat ramp. 40 acres of milfo was discovered right there. Uh, a consultant was hired by the DCR. We're fortunate in that we're a park. So the Department of Conservation and Rec Recreation came forward to create a management plan, ACT, Lycott, all those guys writing up a plan for us. In early 2003, an NOI was approved by the town of Natick because at that point it was only in Natick. This is Natick. This is Whaling. This is Framingham, as you can see. And there's that mass pipe coming from. Uh, within a very short amount of time, that approval was appealed. Doesn't take much to appeal. You need no merit. And it can be one person, a buddy, or 10 people, not a buddy in Massachusetts. So the reason for the appeal, of course, was herbicides were included in the mechanical and non-mechanical. So we got going with the mechanical. That's when we kind of fell into a spin cycle. Our 40 acres quickly turned into 80 acres, quickly turned into 100 acres, quickly turned into 200 acres. But we worked hard and we worked together. We tried. As far as the NOIs go, which is called the Notice of Intent, as far as putting together a plan from going through all this for seven years before we got to our first breakthrough of batting it back and not having it moving forward, was getting together. Like this. Whether you have a difference of opinion or not, get together. Go hand pull with George. Come to meetings. Go to their meetings get together. It helped us a lot because we were, okay, next slide. It's a picture of my strapping son here. So we got to work. What did we do? Mechanical means. Immediately we started the 40 trained weed watcher uh, program hand pulling. Um, we also bought benthic mats to put, that smother it. We also did a weevils study, putting weevils into an area, weevils. Solar bee circulators, we spent $90,000 buying two solar bee circulators and working with Northeastern researchers and students who took and tracked data. We were hoping we could put the solar bees in and just move them around and kill the milfoil here and just move them around the 25, acre, 25 miles of shoreline. It didn't work. Diver-assisted suction harvesting, the dash that was brought up, that was a good thing, okay? The dash was a good thing. It's expensive, but it helped us cut through some channels so that boats could navigate and not uh, be dragging it all over the place. It also helped us in the beaches. So you can see the buoys of this beach going around and we did harvesting inside there. And then people who were swimming were not supposed to go outside of these buoys. Um, we also did a, um, a lot with uh, dealing with nutrients. We got the town of Wayland to put in uh, $30,000 that was voted at our town meeting to put a whole new drainage system for the whole neighborhood coming into here. Uh, it's, it's helpful. Milfoil wins. We all know that. Milfoil's bright green for a reason, because it wins. So even if you cut everyone off from that pond and you move the pond up to the middle of Canada with no people, or let's say not Canada, someplace warmer, like someplace in Massachusetts with no people, the milfoil will still win over the native species. But it helps when you get to management, when you can reduce the nutrients as much as possible. We send a note to a Butters every year 
to try to just remind people what to do and education to not fertilize this stuff. The infestation affected our ecosystem and our recreation. As you know, it grows and spreads fast, and it grows into a rope-like mass. Birds, cormorants, they don't want to dive into it. They're, they're smart enough. They're not going to look for fish in there. <clears throat> fish try to move and find a better spot, a spot where it isn't as thick. And the oxygen levels will eventually start to drop, especially in a small pond like Martin's Pond. This is 600 acres, and, the, and yours is 100. When the oxygen levels begin to drop over time, it will begin to have a stink, and then eventually it won't sustain life. As far as recreation goes, our swim areas were limited, <coughs> and there was the danger, always the danger of these ropes breaking off and coming in. We had one drowning. It was never uh, documented as being caused by the milfoil, but the people thought it did. 19 years old, swimming out and back, racing his girlfriend's little brother. He didn't come back. The little brother came back and told the lifeguards, I don't know where he is. They came, the firemen came. He was outside the buoys and he died. And even though we were sure it was nothing to do with that, that's all we had to go on. It was in a 19-year-old healthy freshman in college, dead. It changed for us. That day changed us. And we had been working together. We'd been getting together, like I'm telling you, get together. Whether you're in a different world, if they're writing an NOI, be there. Don't just say they're writing something to put in and they're going to use herbicides. Don't do it. Go with them and talk about what you can do and what you can make it yours, too. That changed us. In a much lighter way, recreation was affected. Taking out the sailboats from the racks over here, a boat would have to pull the kids out because sailboats will no longer sail when there's a mat of milk boil on top and pull them out to deeper water, which we have, going 60 feet. Our milfoil grew to over 20 feet deep because we have a clearer lake than you have. But it still wins, and our lily pads left, and our pot of McGeaton, I thought was gone, and our water celery, I couldn't find any. A lot of stuff was being taken over. Years were going by. So we can go to the next slide. In the fall of 2008, this is how Finley Cove looked. And then in the summer of 2009, this is how Finley Cove looked. This is in the North Pond, just that northern pond. And this was sort of a breakthrough. We had whales near the ponds, the two southern ponds. The northernmost pond didn't. So an idea came up which was that the two towns up there, Wayland and Framingham, would write a new NOI. This is after s more than one NOI had gone through the spin cycle. <clears throat> and try to just, just deal with one area. So North Palm was treated with triclopyr. But again, it was everyone. We had all been working together. And no one was going for this. It would have been appealed. No one was going for this unless there was a follow-up plan when are we going to check for milfoil again? Who's going to check? And at what threshold would we use herbicide again? If it's less than a certain number of stems per acre, can we have a promise that we wouldn't? Well, that's what we did. The trichopere was used, and it was successful. It was treated in one day at part per million levels in pellet form. This, these pictures were in a newspaper article that came out in the summer of 2009 titled The Lake is Back. People who lived or visited the southern two ponds could come through this to this. So they saw that there was success and then they wondered, well, are we going to follow up? Are the promises going to be kept? Since 2009, we have not 
treated with herbicide again. So there was the concern that once herbicide, always herbicide. But you gotta be together on it. Report milfoil. Get them over here to get it out of there, especially when it's this deep. Because I did hand pulling, and I could only do hand pulling this deep. I couldn't put my head under and start trying to dig at weeds that are like ropes. They're not like your regular weed. So, also cost. People thought, well, you're gonna spend a lot of money, and then you're gonna spend a lot of money, you spend a lot of money, you spend a lot of money. The first year for this 200 acre pond, we spent $75,000. Triclopyr is much more expensive than diquat. And then in the past five years, we've spent almost nothing. We've just spent on hand pulling and um, boats coming in, uh, professionals coming in to get it out. We also did one experiment with herbicide on this same pond in an area where there was a little cove that we did an experiment with a limno curtain, if anyone knows what those are. That's a curtain that will be put into the water to the bottom. It can be good for a little cove area or a little area where you don't want herbicide getting out. It allows water through, like Gore-Tex lets air and through, and it won't let the herbicide through. So it's good to be used as a barrier, and um, ACT has those, and they ran that experiment with us. And next slide. Another concern was that we were turning the lake into a swimming pool. So this photo was taken in the summer of 2009. You can see we had an explosion of fish nests. This is an area that was 100% covered. You can see how shallow it is. And then we see here the pot of Magetan coming back, curly leaf pond weed. And what's really neat about this picture is you see how curly leaf pond weed, a native plant, it's not bright green. And, the, and there's a reason for that. It comes up in the spring. It's a seed plant. It's not one that does the fragment thing. It pulls just the right amount of nutrients. It drops down in the summer. It doesn't cause a problem for anybody and comes right back up in late August to bloom again. It's a beautiful, it's, it's the right plant. It's the one that the fish like to hide in. And we were thrilled to see this back. And we were on a pontoon boat right here on a pontoon boat looking at this, taking this picture with people on our boat that had been on all sides of the this. And it was just great because trust was building, follow through was building. So we followed up with those other two ponds. How'd we deal with it? Well, four years went by and we all went to the um, state to ask for someone to help us write another NOI and we wrote it together. We put in the thresholds for the other two ponds that after treatment, there would not be any more treatments unless the plants were above a th certain threshold, which puts the onus on all of us to make sure that we see it, we tell someone, and we get a lot of eyes on the pond so that we don't let it get above that certain threshold. It becomes our responsibility too. We also allowed for opt out. If you're in a butter and you don't want the pellets put behind your house or you don't want the, uh, the hose that's in the water and they're coming around doing it, you don't want them to go by where you live. We, allowed for, we, we didn't allow for, we came together on opt out. And several people did opt out. And we went to the corners of the property line, 70 feet out, that area. But if a person opted out, we needed to work with them for an opt-in, that a dash boat would be coming or something would be happening so that we wouldn't do this treatment and then have a big patch that was gonna be a big problem. The DCR documented the regrowth of the native plants in a summary of the South and the Middle Pond that just came out last year, at the end of 2014. And it was very exciting to see how regrowth happened there too. Uh, that was a different herbicide, and the reason was because that contact herbicide doesn't travel through the soil. It binds with soil. We also shut off the wells in the town of Native. Both wells were shut down for the day of treatment and several days beyond, and then testing was done of those wells. 
so that they could be shut off if it were found in the well, <coughs> and it wasn't. The water department didn't feel it would be in the well, and it wasn't required to shut down the wells. But we worked together with the native water department, and we shut down the wells for the time that it seemed like a buffer of time. Uh, we didn't treat around the wells either. We made that a buffer area, use different means. Just shrink the areas where you need to use mechanical means. It also wasn't a bad thing to do because with all the Homeland Security stuff, every town is supposed to know how to divert to other water supplies if, if someone comes in and poisons our water tomorrow. So it was a good exercise, and the town of Natick did it. And so we'll go to the next slide. You know, I'm here just to personally tell you what happened at our, at our place. And our, pro our process is going to continue. But we're in a great place right now. And we had a group that helped us. This Whale and Surface Water Quality Committee is another pond, Dudley Pond. They had it before us. We had it before you. And you have it before someone else that hopefully you'll be able to help someday. They put all of the documents, all of the PDFs of every report up on their website. Just this guy, Mike, does it. So our reports that can be found through the state somewhere too, you can go to this website right here, you can write this down today, and you can see all of the reports on Lake Chichewit and all the science and all the data, what we wrote as NOIs. We have an NOI to offer, the one that we used last year to anybody who wants it. And um, I'll go to the last slide. And there's a coumarin back on Lake Chichewit, as happy as could be, fishing away. And um, really, we feel like our ecosystem's been saved, and we feel like our recreational life has been saved. And it, this isn't really about us, is it? It's about who's going to be after us. So I would just highly recommend that you, you find ways to get together like this more and more and more. Right, thank you. Um, take your time. Okay, I just want to um, mention that while we were meeting, um, Jim Straub uh, did did come in today because we're going to start our question and answers. Uh oh. But um, Jim Straub in the green shirt, raise your hand. Uh, great guy. He came out to the pond this summer. Um, I've ice fished the pond. Oh, they recently. Yeah. Very nice. But he's the program coordinator of the Mass DCR Lakes and Ponds program, has been for a very long time. So um, all of our panelists are going to be available for um, questions. Chris is going to uh, run our questions session. But um, before you leave tonight, please do fill out these blue forms because we want to know how, the, how everybody feels. And there's a survey box in the back or we'll be collecting them at the door. Okay, great. I really want to thank everybody who showed up tonight. It, it shows that there's some passion on this subject, uh, especially from the very distinct panelists that showed up today, too, each offering a different approach um, and a different view, uh, all basically to educate us so that we can come together as a community, make the right decision uh, as early as possible. Um, we don't have to have a 13-year fight to save Martin's Pond that she related to us that they had at their spot. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to two questions to the panelists uh, and just remind you that we are all on the same team at this point, just get, trying to get ourselves educated, finding out the best processes, the best ways to do it, uh, and just ask that people be respectful with uh, questions and debate. Any, uh, I'd like to open the floor if there's any questions at all. Please. On the uh, Lake Chichewit, you mentioned you had three or four people hopped out. Were there different reasons, or it seemed like there was one pervasive reason that the people were hopped out? Were they concerned, not educated, or just, just? They were concerned about herbicide. They didn't want the herbicide um, near them. And uh, th these. Why is that? Is there a downside to the herbicide? Well, one woman who opted out was actually a woman who had signed the appeal. Uh, one of the original appeals, maybe the second one too. 
and uh, she she was just has been so wonderful we've been working together over the years and what she did is she put down benthic mats and um, they were pushed up by the milfoil literally lifted off around her uh, shoreline and she over the years I think all of us working together getting out there being together and then seeing what happened on North Pond and also the follow-up testing and also turning off the wells which was a big concern of hers um, I think the NOI going above and beyond was what that was about going above and beyond and she was um, not just opting out for that area behind her house, feeling she, it would keep it somewhat away um, from where she, her dog went in or where her grandchildren went in or whatever. Um, and the part per million levels that were tested, you can look up if you go to those documents that Whale and Surface Water Quality Committee posted, it shows the daily testing of going down in about 72 hours. Um, the issue uh, with with her was as she be, we all became part of one team when we wrote the NOI it was an idea um, that she had and other people had and also buffering around the wells and then turning off the wells it was all everyone kind of listening to each other and that's how that came about so I mean her concerns whether I mean you can take a material safety data sheet and we can all you know pass it around and find things that you know one person says oh you know it's it's approved for zone two it's approved to be put into a reservoir and then another person says I don't want to be anywhere near it you know and so we kind of tried to work together and it took a long time but again that NOI is a great uh, document and I can try to get it up here so that maybe if I mean there's more meetings and especially the group that's getting together just about weeds could, could use it I'm just going to add to that, and I agree. Um, the worst thing, uh, Jim Straub again with DCR, the worst thing with us is right now, or in the last 15 years, has been the internet. Uh, you can type in anything and you come up with stories that aren't validated. Um, for the chemicals that we use here in the state, uh, they go through about 15 years of testing at the federal level and then at our state level. Um, what we were noticing at some of the early, like Sandra says, these were meetings that were early on, People would bring in reports from Bob from the middle of Texas that said he, they treated the lake with this chemical and all these turtles died. Well, there was no scientific data on that compared to a stack of papers that scientists at EPA and in the state, DEP, had done. Um, and with over time, with meeting with these people and showing them that, you know, there is a science here. This isn't just something that someone mixed up in their basement and said, oh, this kills weed the long history behind this, um, but that was an education process, and I think that at the DCR, at the state level, that, and I, and I don't know, I don't want to speak for Mark, but I think that was frustrating for us because at 40 acres, we could have really whacked it back in 2002, 2003. Once it gets to 200 acres, you, you know, you're really super limited to what you can do. I mean, I wish we would have caught it at one acre. It would have been really good. It would have been super successful, but it's wonderful now. It, it, it's um, uh, I'm actually able to say the word Lake Kachichu again without cringing. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's an education process, and that was that was our biggest thing. Um, those of you who are scientists know we know the science, but we don't know how to educate people who think differently. You know, you know, um, and that was the that was the tough part. And I think Mark can agree to that. Um, that was our problem with Kachichu and many other ponds in the lake. And the issue is that the appeals process does not have to have merit. So you, you, anyone you know, can say, I just don't want to do that. So that's why it's really important that everybody be involved in the writing of the notice of intent together. So there may have been things in our notice of intent that might not have been scientifically required or scientifically proven. It didn't matter. The, the point was that people needed to come together on what could we write that the group would say, well, okay, if we do that, then, then I won't appeal. Um, and that's exactly what happened, is we wrote that. But we had five years on North Pond, too, so the trust was built because people said, they're going to treat every year and all they want, and hey, 
everybody wanted less herbicides or none at all. And we tried for seven years with the other stuff. So we said, and we're not giving up on the other stuff because the other stuff is the follow-up. The dash boat's the follow-up. And the going out there and making sure we don't, I mean, we have to go out and, and every fall, every spring, and everybody throughout the summer. We have uh, no to butters, the phone number to call. If you see one plant, because we've got healthy plants back, and I, the, how fast they came back is unbelievable. We have another question in the back? Yeah, I guess given the fact that hand pulling isn't really an effective way of eliminating the problem, um, in doing nothing, what would happen to this pond? And I'd like to address that to the doctor. What would happen to Martin's pond if nothing is done other than trying to hand pull? And I want to know what will happen to the plant life, the fish, and everything else at the pond. And time. And yeah. Anything else? That's a good. Those are. Those are that that that's that that to me that's the those are the exact questions, right? It's about so you have an, uh, a new species that's been found in the pond. There's a long history of knowledge about how Eurasian water milfoil how it spreads and how it can move and and you know not just in in Massachusetts but all over the United States. So. Part of it is, 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 is there's uncertainty involved with this. There just is, and I think, and the science side of things too, and I think that's why it's interesting when you think about the history of the pond and having 12 years of information about all the plants that are in there because it's, it's very helpful. Um, you have context um, um, for what's gonna happen. So how fast will milfoil expand? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, and that's why I brought up turbidity in this pond. The fact that this pond is so brown and so turbid and it's so limited by light um, that even fanwort, when it was treated, came and went. I mean, you can see fluctuations. Na there's a lot of natural fluctuations in Martin's Pond from year to year. All the aquatic plants that grow in there, uh, except for the lily pads, um, that are dependent on growing up through the light, up through the, right, up through the water column to reach the surface. There's huge variability between years. So um, it could be that it, you know, if the conditions are right and, and the fact that the sporadic little plants everywhere are up to six feet deep, which is unlike any other plant on the pond, at least in the last 12 years, it could expand very rapidly. It could be the same as it is <laughs> this year, right? I think it's the, the question is about, from my perspective, so that's an unsatisfying answer. I think there's a lot of evidence that Eurasian milfoil, once it gets established, grows and increases in density. The relative expansion of that is up for debate. Uh, if, Mer if, if, if Martin's Pond wasn't turbid, I think the answer would be a lot clearer and say, look, it's going to expand very rapidly. There's enough light. There's plenty of nutrients in Martin's Pond. <laughs> the sediments are very nutrient rich. There's a lot of nutrients in there. It's the, it's the color of the water. The same reason you can't swim in the pond, right, is based on that, that turbidity, right? The color of it is, is, is that light doesn't penetrate down. 90% um, um, of the light is wiped out in the first, you know, two feet of water in many cases, right? It's, it's very dark. If you float at the bottom of the pond in the middle of the summertime on your back and look up, it's dark. There's no light that penetrates down to at six feet, right? Bennett done it, did it the last summer. Uh, it's remarkable how much light is, is there. So um, I think you guys are fortunate that it's early on in, in, in an outbreak and you have an opportunity now in discussion about um, you know the potential risks, right? You know potentially it could expand very rapidly, it may not. Um, um, so I think that in, in predicting that, um, my thought of this and, and having worked on this in a lot of other places is that um, uh, to manage the uncertainty, sometimes you can think about, you may be in a good position where you can manage some smaller, right? Maybe it's the possibility of doing pilot studies. Like rather than do a whole lake uh, kind of treatment or something like that. It's not, and it's not for me to decide. But I'm, I'm not a, a resident of the, you know, of, of North Reading. But I think there's opportunities to kind of look at, uh, to to experiment a little bit um, with some potential different types of treatments and see what happens, um, and see what the effect is. And I think that's where the monitoring comes in. Is that you have a pretty good data set already about what's happened. If you do anything, you can see what's going to happen. And you can follow up on that and find out what the longer term effects of that are. But there's uncertainty with this. Um, and there's also risk. And the risk is that if you do nothing, 
um, then um, you know we know the the, the the potential that's there. But there's there, just be I think it's anyone worth their salt in the, on the scientific side. We say there's uncertainty in the spread of, of of plants like this in highly turbid lakes, shallow lakes, which Martin's Pond is. So I don't know if that answered all the different points you had about it. Well, it, it, it sort of did. That you can't make a commitment. If milfoil does take off and takes over the pond, what happens to the life in the pond? Well, it depends how you define life, right? So there's other plant life, there's a, a fish, right, right, right. Well, you know, I didn't mean to be glib about it. I mean, you know, it, what's the time frame for that? I mean, there's, there's evidence that it chokes out the canopy of other plants and plant diversity is negatively impacted by that. Talked about decay. Um, if you have a large canopy and it dies and you have a lot of decomposition, you can have um, a, uh, a lot of loss of oxygen, biological oxygen demand, right? The decomposition goes and it can, particularly later in the summer, it can deplete oxygen supplies and that can have an effect on uh, anything that's aerobic, right? It starts getting below certain levels. So there's another longer term impact of it. In terms of the density of the canopy, where you talk about, um, you know, if you've ever been in these ponds, right, Eurasian water milfoil can be incredibly dense canopy, right? And it can prevent uh, fish movement and all kinds of things. Um, how far it gets to that, to the point where that's inhibitive of movement of fishes, it's, it's hard to say. Um, right now, it depends on the density of it, right? And if there's small patches that are incredibly dense, that's one thing. Um, and there's other patches where it's not. Um, that's different. So I think the impacts can be um, multiple effects. Given a long enough time, there is evidence that lakes that have had taken over by Eurasian water milfoil, and there are a bunch of them, I, Wisconsin, right? Um, there's a lot of lakes out there and um, that there was uh, clear uh, long-term impacts on the, on the ecosystem and, and overall in terms of the diversity, the plant diversity, the fish diversity, uh, macroinvertebrate diversity, um, and, and these kind of effects like oxygen depletion um, were, could be catastrophic in some cases. But it's, it's uh, um, you know, there's a lot of variability um, between years. So saying in one year it might be a tough year and then another year it, right, it may recover somewhat, or the, the, right? Um, it, 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 I, I, so again, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I think there's a lot of evidence. I think knowledge is power in this case. There's a huge, there's a huge database on Eurasian water milfoil and, and different experiences like that. But you know, these lake systems are unique. Uh, um, and Martin's Pond flushes out quickly. It's shallow and it's very turbid, and it, and it, it's 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 its own kind of system. So uh, I think, and from that perspective, um, you have to interpret everything from that unique kind of status that it has. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, I'm asking Jim, Jim and, and Mark, have you worked on lakes that are similar? You know, I, I know that you, you showed some, but you know, what have you, where have you, how have you seen the, the progression of things go? I, I know we know it's not predictive, but you know, tell us a story. So how, how have we seen ponds like this react? <laughs> um, <laughs> We were, I was actually just talking w with some fish and wildlife um, biologists about this year. Um, we are having, a, we are going to have a, a really big concern about oxygen depletion. Uh, Dr. Lyons said that because of ponds with heavy milfoil and there's been so much snowpack, that the light hasn't been able to get down. So when the plants start to rot, you know, banana peels, whatever, you know, you, you think the organic matter starts to rot. The, uh, the oxygen goes down. Uh, we're worried about this year a lot of fish kills, uh, a lot of die offs, a lot of oxygen depletion. Um, I've seen that in other lakes. This, we have many shallow, what we call uh, field ponds. This was once a field or a small stream dammed up to make a, you know, it's not like a chituate where it's 60, 70 feet deep. It, this is, um, that organic matter um, is fertile and it's going to make stuff grow. The one thing I can guarantee you is the Eurasian water milfoil will not disappear. That, is, that I can put a thousand dollars down on and, and bet you heavily. How long will it take to take over the pond? Again, I, I can't give you tomorrow three days, but I can guarantee you it will not disappear on its own. Um, and you can think that every year, you know, think about it, every year, even if it stays the same, you guys are going out, you're boating in it, birds are in it, kayakers in it, breaking it up. Even if it never drops another seed, you're still going to help to spread it. 
Um, Mark can tell you that Eurasian water milfoil has this great little uh, self-preservation thing that when the water gets below about 45, 40, it gets very brittle. So wave action can break it up. It's smart. I mean, you know, it's not going to take over the world anytime soon, but it, it's smart enough to say that, you know what, we'll break up and we can spread around the pond on our own. Um, we have many, many ponds in the state that are like this, uh, that we deal with on a yearly basis. This is, you are not unique. You are in a good position that it has not taken over the entire pond. We have some ponds that are like this that you could walk across. And birds do, you know. Um, and, and I have, I mean, I know Mark has seen it, but I've seen it here in Mass. So, even, even like a 90 acre pond? Oh yeah, ponds. yeah, we have one down in uh, Ames Knoll, Ames Pond, that is, it has kabamba in it and Eurasian water milfoil. It's a long skinny, six feet deep. And I'm not saying that's going to happen next year with Martin's Pond. Again, we don't know. But I know the Eurasian Water Mill Club is not this event. Did you have a question? Mark, Mark goes throughout New England. So he, I mean, he can have the whole. No, uh, the, the only thing I was going to add is, you know, obviously there's no absolute predictor. But what we do have is history. Up until three years ago, we didn't have it. The year before last, we had a little bit of it. This year, it's exploded. If you do trend analysis, what's next year going to be like? Well, especially because people use the pond. There are motorboats on it, there are kayakers, there are canoers, and all of those people on the pond are, are just going to, they're going to make it multiply. With every oar that goes in, with every motor that goes in, it's going to pick it up. And it's a state pond, so there's no controls you can put around no. who can and can't use. What, what are we planning on, on, on doing at this point, Janet? Hmm? What are we planning on doing? So, um, the first step was to come here tonight, which we planned a couple months ago, and all hell broke loose with the weather. Um, we are working with DPW, and our town engineer is here. I see two to selectmen here, and other one was here earlier. Um, so we're talking to the selectmen, talking to DPW about what we can do, what kind of funding sources may be available, and we really wanted to hear from all of you and anybody who has concerns, what do you think? We went, we spent a lot of time trying to educate ourselves. We went to conferences. We, I mean, we've been doing these kind of things for years, but specifically this year, we got educated on, on um, invasive species. Um, Jim Stroud came out. Spoken, spoken to Mark many times, John, all sorts of people. But anyway, there has to be buy-in from everyone in the town. And because we don't have a state park on our lake, what Lake Chichu was lucky to have, the state will not fund the treatment of Martin's Martin Pond. So if we decide that part of the, the option that we're going to um, look at is going to be an herbicide treatment, then we've got to We've got to locate, identify the money. Um, it's not a lost cause. Um, there may be funds available. And we're working with the town to try to see what funds are there, what funds have been already put aside in maybe previous situations for Martin's Pond that could be diverted to this cause. So that is one of the reasons why we really urge you know, the selectmen to come. We have this on NORCAM so that we can get get um, everyone in the town to understand that you know, we have a problem, we need help, and we certainly are not going to fund it through um, a hot dog sale. So it may mean something like identifying funds through the town, it may mean something like a warrant article at a town meeting um, where we're going to need support. And so by getting the word out and, and educating everyone about what are the true facts about it all, we are going to look for everyone's support and, and at least they're concerned and, and, and trying to become knowledgeable about it. We understand that there could be, if, if we decide to then, you know, there's been no vote of the committee, okay. Er, er, everyone was waiting for tonight um, before, the, the committee has not voted on what we will recommend or what we will then go forward with. It wouldn't be fair to do that, um, but uh, without, without having met the public. So that's where we're at right now. So 
if there's a if there's a town meeting, I hope everyone will come. If people have concerns about it, like Sandra said, I hope that they get involved. On either side of the issue, on whatever is decided and what we decide to go forward with, please fill out the surveys. Anybody that watches this on North Camp, email us. Let us know. What do you think? And then when we go to town meeting, um, and, and if it's support, if something is supported, the herbicides are supported by town meeting and it's put forward or it's supported through the work of DPW, then there may be an appeal. People have the, the, the right to appeal. If there's an appeal, we will then go through that process. Appeals are, are won and appeals are, appeals are lost. We have to have the patience and the perseverance to not give up and, and work to you know address this problem. So that's that I that's I would think I I don't know. So that, that's pretty much what the committee has feel how the committee feels. <coughs> Can I just ask, uh, so yeah, I'll never know this as well as you will, probably most of us won't. Um, is, is there a proposal, are you proposing the herbicide? Are you proposing, do you have a recommended treatment plan based on what you know so far? And approximately how much of it cost if you've done that? We wanted to have this meeting tonight yeah. because we have not, we have not taken a straw poll. We have not um, said, hey, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna have this meeting, it's just a matter of course. We really wanted to hear everything that's out there. Um, so, no, we don't have a recommended, um, we don't have a, a decision, no decision has been made. That being said, we have asked um, Mark, and through talking to Sandra, we know that we're probably talking about um, under $100,000 somewhere, depending on what, what um, chemical is used, if herbicides are used. If, if, if divers were used with suction and that kind of thing, uh, from what we heard at our things that we've gone to, that is, could be way more money than that. So, you know, sometimes what is, if, if we could hand fill perfectly the entire pond with a throng of people, and it would take, you know, a year to do and get every root and never have to use an herbicide, um, That'd be the best thing, right? You can get rid of every plant, never have to touch a chemical. With unlimited funds, we can do anything, right? So a lot of these things have to be laid out. And so we're looking for you. We're gonna have discussions with probably the Board of Selectmen, with conservation, with people like Jim Straub, with people like Mark Fellow and John. We are gonna have to create a lake management plan that um, draws out what is the future of our lake, what do we want this lake to be. I think um, George took the tally of, yeah. out, out there about what people were saying, what they used the pond for. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the purpose of that, we kind of had a feeling of the end result is, you know, everybody sitting in this room enjoys the pond for different reasons. You know, some of us live right on the pond, so it's waterfront living. Some of us come from the other part of North Reading to, or other towns to kayak. Some people just come here to fish. Some people come to ice fish. I mean, everybody enjoys it for different reasons, right? So everybody has a different level of passion for why they enjoy the pond. Uh, and that's why we're here tonight. And that's why we'd really like you to fill out those surveys because that's gonna better help us. It, 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 it's gonna better educate us as to what people's comfort level is and what their threshold is. And then we can make an educated proposal moving forward. Two questions. Uh, the gentleman who runs the, uh, the water company. Um, so again, just my own opinion, by the vote today, it sounds like the only way we're going to really treat this is the herbicide. And, and I heard you say, you know, we never had to touch the herbicide. But yes, it's money. And yeah, it'll be a lot of fighting. Other than that, what's the connotation of the herbicide? Well, no, I mean, it's, um, you know, there are concerns about non-target impacts. And, you know, as, as Jim said earlier, I mean, this, these are pretty heavily studied through the state and, and regulated. So the, the products have to be first registered by the EPA. Then DEP looks at them. We have to go through the local permitting process through um, the Town Conservation Commission through the Wetlands Protection Act. So they would get the first 
they, they would have really the primary authority of reviewing the notice of intent, the NOI application, and then if that is passed and approved and you have an order of conditions in hand, then you still have, we still have to get another annual permit every year from DEP to actually do a site-specific application with the herbicide. So there's a lot of layers of, of study. Um, but there are still concerns over non-target impacts to, you know, primarily non-target plants because they're herbicides. They're really designed to, to injure plants more so than fish or other organisms. But, you know, people have concerns over what impacts are to those species. Generally, when they're used in accordance with the label and, you know, we're doing, you know, these type of treatments, the impacts are really limited to plants. I mean, the, the, the non-target impacts are usually a result of um, oxygen depletion as those plants die off. Sometimes you can rob oxygen out of the water and that can threaten fish or other aquatic organisms. So you take measures to prevent that from happening, but there really is a very low risk of direct toxicity to any, any species other than the plants that we're trying to treat. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, just a natural, you know, concern. It's it's a it putting products in water is you know it seems like it not necessarily the right thing to do. But again, I think we have a, we have now only about ten, ten in Massachusetts active ingredients that we can use in the water that are registered for use in the water compared with probably a couple of hundred active ingredients you can use terrestrially. So there's a, it's a pretty limited amount of products we can use in the water pretty heavily regulated um, and they're it, it's probably the most looked at um, you know maybe other than food crop tolerance I mean this is probably the most heavily regulated pesticide market so um, they're really careful about what we can apply and the products go through re-registration all the time so actually all those that I listed up there the three of those um, fluoridone's been registered in the U.S. since 1986, Diquats, I believe, 1962, and triclopyr started as a terrestrial herbicide. It, it got registered in aquatics um, in the late 1990s, but it had been used under experimental use permits for about 15 years before that. So these have all been around for a long time and used a lot. We probably have, uh, there are probably over 200 permits issued every year for aquatic herbicide treatments in Massachusetts. Can I ask if, if these treatments, these herbicides have been improved chemically uh, over the last 10, 15 years to limit uh, potential issues or are these tend to be the same chemical compounds that have been around forever, they're just more carefully regulated and tested nowadays? It's a good question. It's probably more the latter. Um, the, the active ingredients are the same, and there have been, with fluoridone and triclopyr, there have been some different formulations that have been developed. So both of those come as either a liquid or a granular product. Um, so they, they have changed the formulation to either make it release off the, the pellet faster or slower, but the active ingredient has not changed, and diquat has not changed probably, you know, there, there have been some formulation changes, but not for probably 10 years now. So these so. Are, I mean, they're pretty proven yeah. and heavily regulated EPA in Massachusetts is, I'm sure, as tough as it comes to. Yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> Jim knows well. I think it's Massachusetts, New York, yeah, and Mark California. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And could, you know, it, it doesn't really kill roots and things like that. But given the turbidity of Martin's Pond, and I'm, I'm asking just because I don't know from yep. an educational standpoint, um, if we were, say, we were to do a treatment like that and it would, was to have a good result, with the turbidity of Martin's Pond, that treatment could last quite some time before we see um, matted growth again, right? Yeah, I, you know, again, difficult to predict. I think you probably put enough caveats in what, the way you stated it, but um, but we, we have seen that occur. And probably the closest example I can think of is uh, not too far away at 
uh, Silver Lake in Wilmington, and they had Eurasian water milfoil. Silver Lake. Yeah, and they um, and that's a you know that's a kettle lake, deep, clear, but it's also a very sandy bottom. So the you know the milfoil didn't really. I'm I'm guessing it didn't have deep roots. They did a diquat application from you know budget limitation standpoint. I think primarily, and um, you know it. Had very little has come back. There have been little pockets of it that have come back, but they've had curly leaf pondweed, another um, invasive that have been back that's probably been managed more so than the, the milfoil. So every lake can respond a little differently, but I think with the turbidity issues and challenges here, um, you know, diquat has a chance of lasting longer than it might normally and then, you know, we might expect or see in Lake Kachichuit. So. And I have one quick follow-up, irregardless of what herbicidal treatment uh, a lake community may choose, do they follow up that treatment with gathering up of the dying plants to limit the decomposition, limit the oxygen depletion? I mean, in a shallower pond, I would assume it's probably something that's possible, but has that been done? Is that a course of action, a, a game plan that's been addressed? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, um, but the answer is probably no. In most cases, it isn't. Uh, and the, the primary reason is, depending on which product you're using, part of it is to try to treat the plants before they have developed too much biomass. So you're not, you, you don't want them to be topped out and on the surface because that's a, the greater risk of dissolved oxygen depletion. Uh, but they also like with a product like Diquat and Triclopyr, I mean, the, the milfoil plants are pretty much gone in about two weeks. So there is nothing really left to harvest out of the water. I mean, they decompose to mush, sink to the bottom, and they are, I mean, you can't even rake up fragments of the plants after about two weeks. With the Fluoridone, just the mode of action, it's a slower kill, it takes longer. But in the end, the same thing happens. I mean, those plants are 80, 80, 90 percent water anyway, so there really isn't a lot left after they die back. So, so when is the ideal time <coughs> in the plant growth stage? To, to treat? To treat, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it depends on the product, but usually in, the, in an active growth phase, you want to get it in, some products work differently, the mode of action is different, but most of them, and Typically, I'd say with most of these herbicides, we're looking at that early, early to mid spring period. So we do a lot of treatment work starting in May and kind of continuing right through June. Um, and again, it depends on the plant, it depends on the herbicide flow. There's a lot of other factors, but usually early, you know, before the plants, you know, more than a half to two thirds of the way through the water column. Are there any other? Yes. Yeah, just a quick question. You mentioned about doing some experiments. If you had a chance to do some experiments, you know, what period of time? A year? Two years? Three years? You know, what, what do you think would be required to make that? Yeah, I mean, so you talk about an early. Have meaningful data. Yeah, so you think about you do, and we did this in Wisconsin. We, you know, different lakes. We tried five different things, right? Uh, we did enclosures and all this kind of stuff. But yes, if you want to do a diquat. Um, for example, um, say you did it this spring May or something like that, and you could do a, you could do an area a test area, compare it relative, right? Have a control and kind of a test area to see how effective it was. Uh, you could measure the amount of biomass there. You could even do a, um, you know could quantify that a little bit. Um, so I think whatever treatment you know people decide to do, even hand pulling, you know, you do the hand pulling and you go back and you realize, oh my gosh, you know these roots <laughs> really do. Uh, grow pretty rapidly. You can. I think that's another. All these are examples if you have opportunities to kind of see what happened yeah. and follow up on it. So, um, you know, you can do it on a whole uh, a lake scale, but then there's no really control, right? When, when right. you do that. So I think. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, the beauty of having an early and <laughs> beauty, but the uh, having an early invasion, you have um, you run the risk of it becoming a full blown invasion, right? And I agree. Once you have it, you don't get rid of it. That's 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 part of the game. Is that you're going to have it for for, for 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 the foreseeable future here, for generations to come. But um, the pond pond is not overrun with it, and some of these smaller, denser pockets and, and treated, they could easily be done and compared to see what happens if you didn't do that. Um, that could be really in, in helpful in, in in seeing what the you know. 
potential lake-wide, a, a whole lake you know, treatment might result in. So, yeah, I think it would, no matter what treatment you choose, there's always that option to. Um, so, I mean, but if you did the experiment, I mean, that would be like a 2015 thing. At the end of 2015, you'd know what happened. Yeah, you'd know if kind of immediately after what happened, you could see the regrowth in that same time period. If you did it in May, I mean, these things are going to come back. If they're going to come back, they're going to be back by July. You'll see them, right? Um, so there's the, the, there are those opportunities to, to, to do that uh, for sure. Yeah, you could see the, so I think the monitoring to me is most successful, and I think when I think about Merrimack College, you know, getting involved in this and helping out is that we're cheap labor. Um, we can do it relatively inexpensively. We're relatively close. Um, um, we can do, you know, more than one sample a year. I mean, I think this year, I think I'd like to go back in, 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 in May and, and July and September and do kind of, you know, triple samples to look at density changes over time and to look at the emergence as it comes up through the water column, depending on the snow melt and everything else that's going on and the turbidity. And we have a lot of other data on the pond too in terms of the chemical composition of the water column. I didn't say that, but we have a lot of information on that that we can draw on back from the diagnostic feasibility study that was done. So there's a lot of information uh, to see what happens with these, you know, what happens to the phosphorus in the lake, what happens to the nitrogen, what happens to the dissolved oxygen. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of data we can draw back on to kind of Put it in context of any treatment, and that, that's that's well, pretty it would helpful. It seem too. obvious. I mean, if you can do yeah. a study that quick, it would seem obvious. You know, if we jumped on it right away. You know, get some initial data at least. So when you're going back to town for more money, you can say we did this, we did this, we did this, and you know we have confidence this one worked the best. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems at a minimum we should be doing that. Um, and if we can't find a hundred thousand dollars in our town to save this pond, you know, I'd be really surprised. I mean, that can definitely, that can definitely happen. Um, but that's what we're any other questions? Yes. Yeah, my pond is a uh, headwater that makes the river watershed. And I'm just curious if uh, anybody on the panel has any prediction of when you're kayaking in Myron Brook, below Myron Pond, there's fragments everywhere. It's just amazing the amount of material flowing out of Myron Pond. And I'm just wondering what the potential of risk is wiping out the uh, Mississippi watershed and those beautiful um, wetlands um, you know, further down. How far can this go? Is that a concern? Because you've seen in other areas like this where it's spreading down trees and they don't treat it and, and, and cause problems. Are you asking if the, the milfoil yeah. will spread downstream? It is, yeah. It's it's downstream. I've kayaked right now before. Yeah, it's the milfoil. The milfoil is in the isthmus. Um, luckily, it runs into the ocean. The ocean takes care of a lot of it. But there is milfoil throughout the isthmus watershed. It's in the river. Um, and one of the one of the biggest concerns that we have in many of our lakes is power flows. It's a source of contamination. Um, yeah, you know, anything flowing. Those fragments are all viable fragments. That, and once they settle out, we find that. They don't really settle out in the heavy flow areas. They don't get a chance to root. But in these back coves on the Ipswich and stuff, there mm -hmm. they have a big chance of no flow. Um, I don't think anybody's you know it's it's, it's coming down from you know, multiple sources too. Um, yeah, but that's always a concern. I mean, if you're at the headwaters, that's a little bit better because then you don't have to worry about you know spending a hundred thousand dollars. Then next year, because we do have some ponds that like uh, that are oh. Okay, Chichu is not a good example, but it is. It's, it's, it goes it's downstream. Like three little individual ponds. So if the north pond says, "Well, we want to do, you know, do something," and the other two ponds say, "No," well, they flow into it. So if you don't do something, you, the north pond and the middle pond are still a source. You know what I mean? And that, and that. So yeah, I mean, Martin's pond would be acting as a source. And one of the other statements I was going to say is, boats leaving your your pond. You know, um, I'm sure everyone has a canoe or kayak or a, or a regular sailboat that you're traveling someplace else. You could have fragments on your vessel that you're taking and contaminating a beautiful lake in New Hampshire or uh, Massachusetts. I mean, Walden Pond right now over in Concord. It has no invasive in it. We have a boat ramp monitor there that inspects all the boats coming in and leaving. Um, but still, you know, the possibility is there. Uh, other invasive. You know, that's something else that you got to worry about, too, is you spend $100,000, you clean up your lake. There's a lot of other critters out there. So this is not, you know, that I'm, I told Janet this, and Sandra can probably say I've said this a million times. It's not a one-year deal. 
This is going to be, you guys are monitoring Martin's Pond now. This is it. You gotta, this is a long-term management plan. Uh, you may clean it up, you'll get rid of the milfoil, it'll look great, and then you guys will let your guard down, and milfoil will come right back in. I mean, if it's brought in, it got here somehow, you know? That's why, and, and that's why we really like working with Kachichuit is all those homeowners are out on the lake and we get phone calls immediately. Oh, we got four plants, four plants in this cove. Boom, we're out there. Um, and that's very important. Um, we hate that no one has $100,000 in their pocket right now, and if you do, let me know what car you're driving and I'll, and I'll see you in the parking lot. But you don't want to waste that money. And, and you know, even if it, it takes you a lot of time to get it, you don't want to waste it. So, uh, you know, there's the short-term management plan, and then there's also the long-term down the road. What do we, how we keep Martin's Pond beautiful for your kids, kids, grandkids? You know, that long after we're all gone, Martin's Pond should still be there and usable. Um, so that's something to keep in the back of all of our minds, too. Thank you. David, what are you looking for from a time frame? Uh, I just looked at the Warren articles and mentioned the <coughs> that the Warren articles are due. Um, are you looking at this June town meeting to, to have something available to discuss anyway? A potentially well, appropriate one? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we were trying to get this meeting done two right, months ago. Two months ago would have been. Would have so been. I, I think. We have to have the we have to have the discussion, you know, with, with you guys, and and I've already talked with Mike and Dick, and you know, so we will have to get together to see uh, are there um, you know, perhaps some funds that, that that Martin's Pond already kind of owns in the coffers that could be directed towards this, um, and or is it something is it a capital item or is it a um, is it an operating item? So is it a June or is it an October? I mean, you know, I, I don't know the answers. To, I don't really know the answer to that more than, more than you do. And then you have a placeholder? Oh, that, that's what I'm saying. I don't know. Mike yeah, so I, it's um, I think we have, yeah, I think and I've, I've had some discussions with Dick because we, um, as you remember, we had a, a, a large article a few years ago for the, um, the bridge that could not, the bridge from nowhere. That could not get done, and um, those funds were redirected. And then, you know, could could the balance of those funds be redirected? I mean, we're getting into the weeds now, but uh, so that's a that's a question for that could be something that could be brought up at town meeting. Or I don't know. If the, I don't know what the mechanism is that that needs to go through if uh, if those funds could be used. So the question of identifying funds is uh, a little more, you know, it's complicated. I guess. If we put a placeholder there, uh, which is broad, yes, uh, all encompassing in relation to raise appropriate use available funds, so that it's a public health. Yeah, that's true. It's it's filed simultaneously, but Is yeah. As far as an appeal, it's both uh, it it could be, yeah. I mean, generally the appeal would go to the through the conservation commission if it were to be appealed, but then sometimes DEP will then review it and potentially either uphold the appeal or issue a superseding order. So there's a a lot of ways it can go, but everything starts with the local conservation commission. Um, where 
the Department of Conservation and Recreation is the, we run the forest and parks. That's, I mean, so I can't speak for other state agencies. I mean, there's not a lot out there. I can tell you that there, there are no grants out there or anything like that through any of, any of the states that I know, any of the state agencies. Um, like Sandra said, one of the benefits was is they are a state park and they're trying to, um, I don't know. I offered know to give stuff. you our park. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 50 feet of shoreline park. Um, <laughs> No, there's not that I know of and not through our state park system. All right, if we're set with, we yeah, have another one. Just, just yes. quickly, uh, the numbers going around with the 100,000 dollars, when I look at the screen, uh, it's uh, 43,000, up to 42,000. So what's the real number? Well, I think there has to be a discussion on which, you know, if, if, if we were going to go with herbicides, which one is the, is the best one to use, which is the most effective, and, you know, it, that's a... You know, I, I understand that, but uh, it's still $4,800,000. And that is to acre pond, and then the number is based on... The 92 acre pond and the 40 acre number. Yeah, well, the, well, the, four, the 40 acre was based on the... the 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 major infested areas last year see, so mm -hmm. right so that i mean that but again there though that's a treatment cost so there are other costs that you know the permitting going through that process would carry costs the monitoring um following treatment so you'd have to you'd have to roll that in but mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, i think a hundred thousand would probably be you know more than enough to do anything you wanted out here probably for several years so it's hopefully a number quite a bit less than that that you, you'd be shooting for. I mean, I think those are realistic numbers from a treatment standpoint. Yeah, but even, even um, you know, even if the infestation were a little larger than that, you know, it's, it's not, it wouldn't double, um, for instance. So I don't think you have much more than 40 acres that would warrant treatment based on the report I saw last year at this point. And this is based on last year, by the way? Yes. Uh, well, they they're uh, you know they'll they'll hang on if they get enough light. But as Jim said earlier, I mean that they'll they probably will be hit pretty hard this winter with the snow and ice cover. Um, but that those plants there will be plants down there still that will recover and start to rebound and regrow. I pulled up green milk oil. We saw green milk foil actually, through the ice. Yeah, yeah, I pulled it up for you. That's That's sicker will love it, so it's all wrapped up. On your pond, somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. How far out were you? I can't tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was off the shore. I was off the shore. Okay. Just out there a little bit. No, I, went, I go off the beach, probably about 150 feet right where it starts, and then the sand goes to, to plant. Yeah. I walk out that way, and uh, almost every one of my tip ups had. Green, like, I mean, it's not robust. It's not shooting through the holes and grabbing me and pulling me down. But it's still, it's still alive. It's a green plant. That means it's still photosynthesizing. Um, and it, as soon as, and that's what we've noticed in our clear lakes. And I, and I know Martin's pond is stained, but as soon as the ice is off, native plants are already dead. They're in the, they're, they're not dead. They're seeds. The roots are down there. They're muck. Milfoil's right there, green and ready. In April, we have seen this stuff explode. Why? Because it's the only plant there, it's sunny out, and there's plenty of nutrients. It doesn't matter that the water's 40 degrees. You know, it, it, it's living, it lived underneath the ice. Uh, and that's how this, and that's why it's called invasive. And we're yeah. typically very clear early spring and late yeah. fall. Yeah, that's right, because there's not a lot, you know, maybe you get that first flush, but then you don't have the algal blooms yet. So you, um, that, you know, that could be an issue if you see an exponential increase over the last three years. In, in, in the time of year when you treat, I'm sure, Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, like even with the even with the contact with the die quad, you want to really what you're trying to do there is you're trying to treat the plants. Well, when and also when the plant when there's less starch reserves in the roots, because all the milfoil will in the fall it will send energy into the root to try to grow the root crown in the spring. It tries to put all the energy into growing the plant up again, so through the water column. So what you try to do is let it 
spend some of that energy growing and then you treat it with a contact so there isn't as much energy left in the roots anymore. And that's how you can start to see the, the population wane a little bit over time. All right, if we have no other questions, I'll close that out. I do, will remind you the blue and yellow, these are very, very important to us just to get an idea. They're, they're meant to be anonymous and you can fold them up and I'll put them in a box up here. If you do want more information from us, there is a spot where you can put your contact info, other questions, and you can also go to our website at martinspond.org, read up and send us questions and comments through that term too. And if you'd like to sign up to help the effort, Here, put that right there. I'll turn it over to Janet to close. Yeah, no, we're open. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And our, 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 our